You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. the blue pill i'm your host rich hoffman we're coming to you live from the bold brave tv network so we've had some technical difficulties as usual <laughs> i thank you for bearing with us but um anyway today we're going to be interviewing uh bruce balderston he's um, a um, fire investigator he's actually the inventor developer of a, a software program called um, arson track it's arsontrack.com and um we're going to, uh, since we lost so much time, I'm going to jump right in and let him just talk about, you know, who he is, where he's been, you know, what he's developed. And uh, we're going to go right down this bullet point list. Okay, Bruce, are you there? Yes, I am. Good okay, morning. Okay, partner. Good morning, sir. Afternoon, depending upon where you are. <laughs> anyway, very good. Yes. So let's, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and give me a quick background of uh, your background in wildland firefighting. And, um, oh. You know, what inspired you to become an investigator and then what you've done to uh, yeah, actually accomplish those goals? Okay, well, thanks, Rich. Um, I started with uh, Wildland Fire about 15 years ago in Alaska. Um, decided to be a firefighter. Um, my first year I worked in fire dispatch and decided that, gee, this is exciting when there's something going on, but when there isn't, uh, it's pretty, pretty dull. <clears throat> The following year, I uh, secured a, a job uh, with uh, the state of Alaska as a firefighter and um, got involved there. <clears throat> and I, at this point, have investigated over 500, 400 uh, wildfires and uh, as the chief investigator and uh, assisted with and consulted on additional 300 or more investigation at this point have investigated over 500 400 uh, wildfire sorry about that go ahead there was an echo there that was my fault and um, I've uh, been involved in courtroom testimony uh, on a number of cases in cost recovery uh, as well as arson cases um, so I'm considered an expert witness in wildfire according to the courts so in Alaska, one of my qualifications was fire investigator, and it was the first time that uh, investigating a fire actually identified that it was an arson fire, um, got some background on some people that showed up at the fire and determined that one of them was possibly uh, the arsonist. Um, I asked the gentleman to come meet me at our fire headquarters to talk about fire and he was pretty anxious to do that and after uh, sitting with him for about four or five hours he finally said yes he did set the fire and explained why he set the fire and so we continued a converse conversation and he had finally admitted to several other fires that he had set in the past and ultimately he was convicted of uh, arson and um uh, he was actually considered uh, what they used to call a pyromaniac, somebody who was setting fires for stress relief, which is uh, fairly rare. Um, we don't use the term pyromania anymore. Uh, it's actually uh, an impulse disorder, but um, that that's one type of arsonist. Um, so my background in wildland fire includes being a type three incident commander, uh, task force leader, helicopter manager, and a number of other qualifications. But um, I worked for the state of Washington for four years before retiring, and I was a, a primary fire investigator um, 
called a senior fire investigator where I investigated uh, only large fires and assisted on uh, the fires with uh, the cadre of uh, the state uh, uh, investigators. So um, with my experience there and the number of arson fires I experienced, uh, I developed an uh, arson track. So wanted to get into a little bit the, the actual magnitude of the problem uh, with arson fires in the United States. In 2020, there were a total of 56,000 wildland fires. And Crazy. the statistics are that 90% of all wildland fires are human caused. Uh, the remainder right. primarily are lightning caused fires, but 90% of all fires in the United States, wildland fires are human caused. And of that human caused number, on average, 20% are arson. So in 2020, there were 56,000 wildland fires or about 50,400 human caused wildland fires. Wow. So 20% of that would put the number at over 10,000 arson caused fires in the United States in 2020. Yeah, and when and you in, do the math and divide that by 365, it's what about roughly about 28 fires a day. Right. And so this so, is occurring continuously. Yeah, go for it. Yes, and, and of those fires, uh, over 10 million acres were burned in the United States in wildland. Right. So the average fire was approximately 180 acres. And again, that's a statistical average. You know, some fires are a tenth of an acre and some are 300,000, but the average was 180 acres. So the cost, according to uh, the Forest Service, per acre to suppress, that is extinguish eventually, a wildland fire is just under $1,000 an acre. And I can bear that out both in Alaska and in the state of Washington. Um, that's a fairly accurate figure, I think, no matter who your agency is. So if you take the number of statistical arson fires in 2020 and you apply that number to it, that puts the figure for arson fire suppression at $1.8 billion. That's a pretty big number. Okay, uh -huh. and that's just the suppression cost of arson wildfires. <laughs> that doesn't include the loss of life, the loss of property, the economic impact, and the environmental impact. Now, some people say, well, you know, global warming and da 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 da. When there's a, a significant wildland fire, let me tell you, it destroys at least for a period of time, the surrounding environment. I was on a large fire in, in um, California called the Rim Fire. And I right. had- That was one in Yosemite, right? Uh, you know what? Um, yes. Yeah, and Bruce, you know what? You know, I know we had some difficulty getting started today, but uh, we're gonna jump into this right after the next commercial break. Sure, first commercial no break. problem. But um, anyway, so you guys uh, come right back. This is not the blue pill. I'm your host, Rich Hoffman, and we're coming to you live from the Bold Brave TV network. Come right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation 
author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hi, and welcome back to Not the Blue Pill. I'm your host, Rich Hoffman. We're coming to you live from the Ball Brave TV Network. So today we're talking to a gentleman. His name is uh, Bruce Balderston. He's a uh, uh, fire investigator um, who's um, now developed a software called Arson Track. We'll go into that a little bit. And um, he's been able to take, you know, pretty much all the data that um, is, you know, um, that can actually focus on a particular party that might be responsible for an arson fire. But he'll go into a lot more depth than that. But um, this is like a melting pot where you can actually take these key um, evidences and uh, points and um, and actually put them together in a manner to begin to understand the personality of the arsonist that's in the area and uh, how to predict what his next actions are even going to be. So um, anyway, to you what, Bruce, since we've lost so much time at this point, we have a lot of material to cover. And yes, we will be on next week with you. But let's just go ahead and jump right in, sir. And um, yeah, help us out and uh, fill us in on the rest. You were talking about the rim fire in Yosemite uh, several yes, years ago. Just, I had the opportunity to um, uh, recon a, a uh, an old Forest Service road that led up into something called the Grove, which were the, where the giant redwoods are and a much longer hike than I expected. But <laughs> what I saw there was was phenomenal. You had these trees that are hundreds and hundreds of years old, just decimated. Um, some of them rolling down hills, some of them so large, they seemed like they weren't on fire. And when you'd walk around the back of them, you could see they were burning inside the tree 100 feet up. Right. And entire hillsides were deep in ash and uh, you realize, you know, in seeing that, that, you know, the, uh, at the first heavy rain, all that ash was going to wash down into the, the watershed down in the valley. So, right. the and then also cause is significant. So, yeah. and then also cause the, uh, yeah, the mudslides and so forth. I know it was like a moonscape when I was on the Mare fire back in what, 94 and uh, 93 rather. And uh, yeah, so we're very familiar with that, but go for it, sir. So in continuing the conversation about arson, the FBI identifies six different reasons for arson. Um, the first being thrill seeking or, ent- or excitement. I call it entertainment for some people. Um, mm-hmm. Some people do it for revenge or spite. Um, some people do it for profit. Um, some do it for crime concealment. Um, some do it for vandalism and then extremism. And in these six categories, I've investigated many, many arson fires in all of these categories, with the one exception of extremism. I've never had a, an arson fire uh, based on extremism, but it, it is out there. Well, you and, know, I just want to make a funny comment. You know, the joke is that every firefighter is an unconvicted pyro okay those are all the person personality traits of us anyway but there have been a lot of firefighters volunteer firefighters that wind up being the actual arsonist and um yeah that's another you know lead that we have to look at and consider as a possible suspect anyway just yeah can please continue yes and uh one of the quotes that uh, i wish i had said uh, but i'm going to quote from a gentleman by the name of ed norskag who's written a number of books about arson. Um, he's a, an expert uh, death scene investigator. 
Um, that's his picture. I had the yeah, I have him on the screen share. Yes, doing a presentation with Ed a few months ago in uh, uh, Nevada. Um, but his quote from uh, his book on wildland investigation is that the one criminal in the world who possesses the power of a nuclear weapon at their fingertips is the wildland arsonist. Right. And what Ed's saying there is with a flick of a bick or, or the strike of a match in the correct place at the correct time, someone can burn down uh, an entire subdivision, an entire town, uh, caused tremendous damage. Um, right. It's a serious, serious problem, a serious threat. And when they look at arsonists, wildland arsonists who've been arrested and convicted, it's often found that they've set dozens, even hundreds, in some cases, of fires. Um, the average conviction um, of a wildland arsonist uncovers that the, the typical um, convicted arsonist has set about 38 wildland fires. On average. So that's something to think about. It, it's not a one-shot uh, deal. Right, and this um, is why you created that software in a manner um, that we can actually, uh, let me go ahead and pull this down real quick. But. Um, that you can actually take that that data from all these different incidents and begin to connect the dots and see the uh, similarities between all of them and begin to, you know, focus that uh, that investigation on a particular party. Exactly. Yes. And the, you know, the sad point is less than 10% of all wildland arson fires are ever cleared by arrest. And you think about it, one in 10. So nine in 10 are out there setting fires, setting fires, and perhaps never caught. And of those 10%, which is such a low number, only 1% um, result in conviction. It's crazy. And the most dangerous of all arsonists are, are, you know, it's bad enough if somebody sets a fire and then they burn down, let's say, their garage and collect an insurance payment. It's a, that's a crime. They're an arsonist. Um, but the most dangerous of all wildland arsonists are the spree arsonist and the serial arsonist. Now, let me explain what that is. Serial arson is someone who's setting fire after fire after fire. Uh, technically, you're a serial arsonist if you've set three or more fires, um, but not all at the same time. That each Between each fire, it's sort of a cooling off period, as it's called. A spree arsonist is someone who sets multiple fires at a single time. I have experienced that um, when I was a senior fire investigator in Washington state, uh, we had a spree arsonist that every year around the same time would set anywhere from five to 10 wildland fires in the evening, almost ringing the, the city of Spokane Valley. Um, so. The reason these two types of arsonists are so dangerous is because the more fires they set, the more they learn about where and when to set the fires. It was they learn as they go. So the person that sets one fire, you know, may bur burn down the garage, but may never set another fire. But the person who is setting fire after fire, year after year, or setting multiple fires over a period of time, they learn as they go, and and that's what makes them so dangerous. Right, and then you look at the, you know, the weather conditions that we're seeing today. You know, as the ice caps are melting back from the great flood, you know, 4,400 years ago. Anyway, the point is, is that um, now we're seeing, you know, longer, drier summers. We still have the same winters, but um, yeah, when uh, you know, we look when you look at the image to my right. You know, this is the ultimate sacrifice. These, these are firefighters who lost their life protecting, you know, grass and brush and, and vegetation. And, um, you know, there's been a, such an incredible push to try and increase the technology that we have available, not only, you know, for, um, you know, in regards to like my phone app and so forth, for calculating engine pressure to make sure that nozzle person has enough of water. But again, this is where your software comes into play. So you're able to, um, 
actually begin to um, compile all this data from multiple years and actually go, wait a minute, we have a similarity here and jump in and prevent this from happening and putting our firefighters at risk and from this ultimate sacrifice, as you can see right here. Right, so true. So when you look at an individual arsonist, um, again, the figure of, of those arrested, they average, uh, uh, I might have misspoken before, 35 fires is, is the number that comes up as the average. And you take that figure of the 180 acres per, on average per fire that we talked about earlier, and at the rate of about $1,000 an acre, it means that arsonists that have been uh, arrested and, and uh, it's proven that they've set 35 fires, the figure is over $6 million, again, in suppression cost only. So the right. arsonist uh, is doing great damage to, to the environment, to, to people's lives, to people's homes, um, and to the financial resources of the agencies that are, that are tasked with uh, suppressing wildland fires. So it's, it's a, a big problem that isn't talked about too much. Um, Unless someone's caught, you know, along a highway and it's a big deal, uh, it makes the news. But overall, the problem itself is is not talked about um, generally in the public too much. Right. This is where it's really important. If you see someone suspiciously on the side of the road, you know, unexpectedly, um, by all means, you know, go ahead and um, make that phone call to the law enforcement and say, let's take a look at this and uh, try and recall you know, what the details were regarding the vehicle, the person, the description, and so forth. But yeah, it's uh, it's been pretty, uh, you know, the, the devastation that we're referring to is just, you know, off the chart. And one of the uh, agencies that does uh, an excellent job, uh, in addition to the U.S. Forest Service, because they have actual uh, law enforcement people that are on uh, arson response teams. Uh, I worked with one of their teams in, in Washington State, uh, uh, right on the Oregon border. They came up from, uh, I believe, Bend, Oregon, um, on a number of Forest Service fires that we had. But uh, CAL FIRE does an excellent job, again, because they have people dedicated uh, to this issue. So just as an example, in 2021, CAL FIRE uh, had uh, almost 9,000 wildfires, and they made 140 arrests for arson. Um but if you compare that to the number of fires, and, and CAL FIRE estimates that 90%, uh, I'm sorry, 95% of all of their wildfires are human-caused in some manner. Right. So Negligence even though 140 right, yeah. is a lot of arrests, that's still a small percentage of the number of arson <laughs> fires that they have every year. It's um, It's a problem. And Rich, if we can at this point, I'd like to jump into the advantages or the challenge. So it turns into the challenges that agencies have tracking right. down arsonists. So when you think about the act of arson, the arson arsonist typically acts alone. Now I have had cases where there've been two people, but typically uh, most of the time they act alone. Um, the setting of the fire is a short duration event. They're not hanging around for an hour. They, right. they drive a vehicle up, jump out of their vehicle, usually off a road, uh, light some grass on fire, watch it go up the hill and take off. Um, they're almost always set out of sight of witnesses. You know, they're not doing it in very busy areas typically because they don't want to be caught. Right. And over a time... Uh, the, the period that the fires are set can vary quite a bit. Someone might set a fire a day for three days in a row, then they may stop for a month. Uh, they may set uh, three or four fires spread out during an entire six or seven month fire season. Uh, they're all right. different patterns. So <clears throat> often the, the frequency over time, um, there's a lot of spacing in between um, the actions, um, the use of incendiary devices. You know, Hollywood right. likes to show, here's the arsonist and they're, they're setting some elaborate uh, gizmo that's gonna start a wildland fire. Uh, typically that's not the case. Uh, right. A number of 
incendiary um, devices that are used. Um, are, it's very infrequent um, of those. Uh, all the wildland fires that I've investigated uh, have only identified uh, several, just a handful of incendiary devices, and they're usually very, very crude. Um, the arsonist operates in what we call a comfort zone. You know, they know the roads, they know the areas. Um, yeah, they and, scoped it out, right? Yes, and and, and they pre-planned. So, uh, one of the things that um, uh, agencies, one of the things that it's working in the arsonist's favor too, is the shortcomings of the fire suppression agencies. Um, of all of the agencies involved in wildland arson, they don't communicate with one another. In other words, the Forest Service isn't talking necessarily to the local fire departments or talking to the local sheriff's office uh, unless it's a, a significant uh, fire, you know, well, houses really, burned it's, down. It's, right, if they're under a unified command because it becomes that large and then it's a catastrophe. Right. Then it's when they begin to really communicate. But this is where you bring everybody together and say, in your education and so forth on uh, how to actually manage this, you know, because I can talk about you know, a lot when I worked for CAL FIRE and um, how I had a, a camera on the front dash of the engine, I always took a picture just as we pulled up when I was a firefighter. And then, you know, I told them my, um, my firefighters, when they're uh, mopping up or doing an overhaul next to the roadway, watch for that same car to come by several times because they've always got to come back and check on their little, you know, the status of their little event. And, um, and that's a huge, you know, um, indicator as well but um yeah you consider our response times and um what it takes to actually get in there because once the fire's one acre we are done you know if it's wind driven at all it's going to take the entire mountain out and uh now we're going to be way out in front of it you know evacuating people etc and um yeah so all these different you know aspects you're referring to are just making it really difficult you know and this is where we have to train our crews how important it is to preserve that um, point of origin so that it's not destroyed from a nozzle or um, as the case may go. But we're about to uh, jump into a commercial break um, in about a minute or so. But go ahead and, uh, yeah, please, Bruce, go ahead and finish the session. Uh, One of the us. other challenges for the fire suppression agencies is uh, other than the um, Forest Service and CAL FIRE and, and um, a couple of other agencies, the vast majority of wildland fire investigators that work for fire suppression agencies, um, the fire investigation is just one of their qualifications. They're right. primarily firefighters. Right. Now, I was in that situation um, my whole fire career until I worked for the state of Washington. So as a senior fire investigator with the state of Washington, all I did was investigations 12 months a year. Sure. Um, I didn't get to fly to fires in the front seat of the helicopter, which I sorely missed. I didn't drive an engine to a fire. I didn't put any water on a fire. I s did investigations, but uh, most agencies don't have exclusive people doing fire investigations. So that's right. a challenge for these agencies as well. Right. I know this is the one time you did get a helicopter ride where they dropped you in at the top of a mountain at one point, right? <laughs> and um, yes. And so they say you don't want to meet this guy in a back alley. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, that that picture, Rich, is actually from uh, the Trinity Ridge fire in Idaho, the largest fire they'd ha ever had in Idaho. And I was a helicopter manager, so I was flying. That's all I was doing was flying. Or in that particular case, right? Yeah. Yes. And. Um, Anyway, so, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and jump into another commercial break. And, um, yeah, we lost the whole session. But, you know, Bruce, I so appreciate you being here. So, uh, yes, everybody come back. So this is uh, Not the Blue Pill. I'm your host, Rich Hoffman, and we're coming to you live from the Bold Brave TV Network. See you in a moment. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like, it was almost instant. Like, I had 
relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, Hope, and Support for Caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Hi, welcome back to Not the Blue Pill. I'm your host, Rich Hoffman, and we're coming to you live from the Bold Brave TV Network. So today we have uh, Bruce Balderston, he's a uh, fire investigator, uh, chief, you know, uh, primary um, and, and lead fire investigator. And um, anyway, we're going to let him go into the breakdown of, you know, how is, um, what Arson Track is all about in a manner that um, really get the direct application. And uh, we'll go through... Uh, now, I'm going to be spending all of next week, we're going to be going through the entire process. So we're going to, we're going to just going to briefly cover the high points at this point and then add the rest. And we'll have one more short session after that. But anyway, Bruce, why don't you go ahead and just go for it here, sir? Okay, thank you, Rich. You know, in all the investigations that I did and um, the arson investigations I did, the one thing that I realized is the one thing even though the arsonist has a lot of advantages over the people that might be tracking them, the one thing they can't escape is their personality right? and sort of their life situation. And what I mean by that is uh, they may have a job, they may not have a job, uh, they may have children, uh, they may have a wife or a husband at home, um, but factors in their life will sort of shape when and where and how um, they might set a fire and maybe even why they're setting fires. So if you can hone in on those factors, um, it makes a big difference. Um, on many, many of the arson fires that I investigated, um, I, even after the fact, realized that I had met what I call the insertionist arsonist. That is the person that inserts themselves in some way into the investigation. They might be the 911 caller. They might be the person that shows up on the scene who describes the car they saw. Now, it doesn't mean that anybody that's helpful at, at a fire scene is the arsonist. Um, right. That's a, a serious rookie mistake, but it is possible that the arsonist is inserting themselves. I've had arsonists right. show up and ask, well, how did the fire start? Or have you figured out who did it yet? Or any number of questions, but they will in some way insert themselves um, either into the fire scene or somehow into the investigation. Um, and that was where I was trying to include that, you know, we watched the cars driving by a while yes. fire that was really started on the edge of the road. But you know, um, it also comes down to like we had a, right here in Salem town, we had an arson fire and we had one firefighter that was on scene since two in the morning. He was barely awake in the back while another lieutenant on day ship came in. And I've never been, you know, looked so down upon 
um, when I came up, I started asking questions, you know, what do they know and so forth, right? Because they were, you know, yeah, I had my fire shirt on, whatever. But the point is, is um, yeah, it's like they, those are the key things that they will insert themselves. And so, you know, it was interesting how I felt like I was a suspect. It was like, wow, these guys were, you know, now the training, you know, years of experience, we realize that the arsonist does come back. And, and is so curious because of their personality. They want to know the details. They want to, you know, kind of like have a little bit of a part in, in the investigation themselves. And they'd like to try and fool us or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, and then we talked about, like you said, the personality um, that they can't get away from. And they will continue to be the same way. And that's where we had a, um, you know, a tow truck driver that kept showing up on scene. It's like, what is he doing here? You know, this is the Avenal State Prison. We. I ruled mutual aid into four different counties, and sure enough, he was there, you know, at like three of those calls. But anyway, um, I'm going to let you go ahead and continue, uh, Bruce. I know we're down to, what, two minutes right now, so please help me. So uh, in investigating a, a spree arsonist in um, eastern Washington, um, we met with the Spokane Valley Fire Department, the fire marshals and the fire investigators, and, and we were asking questions and it, it came up that they had had this situation pre, in previous years. And we asked uh, if they had copies of the 911 calls. They didn't. Um, we said, well, where are the files? Well, they're filed away somewhere. And I'm sitting there thinking, gee, we have computers. Why don't we have all this data in a computer? And that's where I first got the idea of arson mm -hmm. track. And I did a very clumsy paper scheme of arson track, I'll keep this short, with the U.S. Forest Service where I was called to investigate three fires. And I predicted screen share, Justin. that the arsonist would be back uh, within a week um, to set more fires uh, further in uh, to the wilderness uh, on the Forest Service land. And that eight days later, the arsonist came back uh, and set two more fires on a Forest Service road and subsequently set additional fires. But that's where the idea of arson track was developed is taking all of this data of, you know, the time of day, the location, um, you know, the 911 callers, photographs, uh, descriptions, um, all of this data in a, a simple database where you can go in and query or ask your database a question you know show me all the fires that happened um and show me their 911 callers and uh let me know what days and times you can put in latitude and longitude and it'll bring up maps in various configurations so that you can take all this data because the arsonist is there if you start accumulating data on your fires not only arson fires, but unknown cause fires and suspected arson fires, put all that data in, you will come across the arson. Correlation. Right, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, um, we're you know, we're down to the last uh, few moments here before we go to our last session. But um, these are the different areas I kind of went through on the uh, on the screen share, you know, your site, including the yes. contact and your other expertise. And uh, one thing right here is community wildfire, you know, protection plan. And this is an example of what you did, you know, up in Alaska, right? And I yes. broke it completely down. Here it is 67 pages and um, it's very comprehensive. When you consider, you know, your abilities, Bruce, and what you brought to the table, you know, in a manner that we can actually begin to have the software to begin to take that data that to go through files from two and three years ago it's like no one wants to do that that's stuck in a you know you know in a storeroom somewhere and now you're able to put that together and, and under one you know on a computer screen and go wait a minute we have a connection here so uh anyway we're going to jump uh, to another commercial break we'll come back for the last recap so uh bruce thank you so much for being here today and we'll again we'll have you on next week anyway this is not the blue pill i'm your host rich hoffman and we're coming to you live from the bold brave tv network Come right back.
The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate-related drug overdoses, and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24-year addiction to cocaine and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Hi, welcome back to Not the Blue Pill. I'm your host, Rich Hoffman, and we're coming to you live from the Bold Brave TV Network. So today, um, again, we've had Bruce Balderston. He's a fire investigator, um, chief fire investigator, and he's developed the software um, Arson Track at arsontrack.com. And uh, you know what, Bruce, let's go ahead and talk about this image that we have right here, please. Uh, <clears throat> it's a... Uh... Uh, a staged photograph of uh, oh, don't pointing, say that. pointing at nothing with the uh, <laughs> former commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources uh, for Washington State. Um, that fire was called the Sleepy Hollow Fire. It was a $100 million loss fire. Wow. It was set by a person with a lighter, uh, set grass on fire. Uh, it went up the hill and I uh, We'll never forget <clears throat> when I was leaving the fire at about uh, 8.30, quarter of nine at night uh, and in Washington in, uh, in July, uh, it's still li barely yes. light then. I yes. heard uh, air attacks say, we've got 10 minutes to pumpkin time and the wind is increasing significantly and it, the fire's moving on Wenatchee. And I thought, boy, that is not good. Well, right. the fire proceeded to burn down a whole neighborhood uh, it went on to uh, burn down a number of fruit warehouses and recycling plant. Anyway, significant loss. And the gentleman that was ultimately convicted of that crime, um, I am very uh, certain that he did not set the fire. Um, I did interview uh, somebody who I believe did set the fire. Anyway, that's another story, but... Uh, uh, Arson Track uh, basically is a software program in the cloud that people can subscribe to. Uh, they can do it monthly on an annual basis. They can do it for their fire season of six months. They can have one user or more users. Um, the cost is uh, less than the cost of one hour of a fire investigator's overtime hours uh, per month. And um, it simply allows you to put in all of your fire data from arson fires, suspected arson fires, and cause undetermined fires. Right. could be arson. And then it's searchable, and you can keep all of your data, all of your information about these fires in one location. It's on a triply secured platform, so no right. one else has access to it. And... Um, I'd like to see more people use it because if they did, they would be tracking down and well, uh, arresting and convicting more arsonists. 
Right, and that's the whole thing is that your system has allowed us to compile all the data, the key data that we can now connect, not just one fire season, but multiple years and see the correlation. And um, anyway, so you know what, Bruce, um, we're down to our last seconds here. I really appreciate you being on the show. Next week, we're going to go into um, much more detail on yes. the user guide and so forth, and we'll break this down. But, you know, folks, thank you for, so much for joining us. I'm so sorry we lost that first session. I had a complete video breakdown again, even though everything worked perfect earlier. Anyway, guys, see you next week. This is not the blue pill. I'm your host, Rich Hoffman, and we're coming to you live from the Vol Brave TV Network. See you Thanks, next week. Thanks, Rich. You got thank it, man. Thank you. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.